Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag CyberSound. Should your laptop ever get stolen and fall into the wrong hands, you would probably be comfortable in the knowledge that the data on it is protected by full disk encryption. But what if a malicious adversary could get around that encryption and access the data anyway? F-Secure's Ulle Segerdal and Pasi Saarinen have discovered a flaw that allows attackers to do just that. And it affects almost all modern corporate laptops, probably yours too. Ulle and Pasi are here today to talk about their research and what companies can do to mitigate the risk. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Janne. Thanks. So, what is a cold boot attack? So the cold boot attack is something that was discovered in 2008, or at least made popular in 2008, which basically is that when a computer is turned off, there is some data left in your RAM memory. In normal cases, you think that uh, every all data is lost when the computer is turned off, but uh, the data remains for a couple of seconds. Uh, and the cold boot attack is basically that you cool the memory to make sure that it remains for a longer time, and then you reboot the system into a different operating system that will dump the memory and read out whatever secrets was in RAM. So you basically reboot the computer before all the information is gone? Yes. All right. Um, tell us about this particular hack. What did you guys discover? Well, the, uh, the the stuff that we were looking at was how do we actually perform this you know, 10-year-old attack on modern machines? Because during these 10 years uh, since the Princeton researchers uh, popularized the cold boot attacks and, and actually provided people with uh, tools to, to try it out for themselves, uh, a lot of mitigation work has been done to try to uh, minimize the risk of, of uh, such an attack working in practice. A lot of those mitigations are around firmware. So your BIOS, as it used to be called nowadays, it's called EFI firmware, but it's still the same kind of thing. It's what actually boots first in your PC before you load your OS. And there are lots of, of settings you can do there. Everything from locking it down with a password so you can't boot from a USB stick without knowing the password to modern features like Secure Boot, which uh, actually requires the OS to be to be signed in, in order for it to be loaded. And uh, what we tried to do is uh, figure out how to still perform this attack on modern machines, even though all these mitigations might be in place. And that's when we discovered the the memory overwrite mitigation. Memory overwrite request is uh, something that uh operating system tells the BIOS that uh, I have secrets in memory and uh, if the BIOS starts and this more bit is set then the BIOS will clear the memory. So a normal procedure is that the operating system starts, loads some secrets into memory, sets this bit and then when the computer is shut down it uh, clears this bit so that uh, the BIOS doesn't have to clear the memory as the operating system has already done that. But if the computer is crashed, like you would do in a cold boot attack, then the operating system never clears this bit and therefore the BIOS will clear the memory itself. Uh, you could wonder why is this uh, thing that sounds very complex needed, why can't you just uh, wipe all memory on every boot. Basically this uh, way of signaling from the operating system to the firmware that a memory wipe is needed is something that's done for performance reasons. So the platform vendors, the PC makers, they don't want every boot to include this unnecessary memory wipe that might take a couple of seconds. They want the machine to start as quickly as possible. So this is kind of a compromise where the operating system can tell the firmware if a memory wipe is needed or not. So you're preventing the computer from clearing the memory so that some residual information remains in RAM for those couple of seconds for you guys. Yeah, so the EFI firmware will check for this signaling bit from the OS on every boot. 
and that's when it will mm -hmm. clear the memory if the bit is set. So what we do basically is when we do our reset attack, when we shut off the computer and uh, we're going to boot it into our own OS, we simultaneously clear this bit physically in the actual memory where those settings are stored. So every PC motherboard, there's a small flash chip which contains both the BIOS code and the BIOS settings. So the EFI firmware and, and all the settings for the EFI firmware. And of course, including this uh, memory overwrite request variable that we're attacking. So what we actually do is connect a small hardware device directly onto the flash chip and change that value to a zero, which then of course fools the BIOS or firmware into thinking that a clean shutdown was performed and everything is fine and they don't actually need to uh, to wipe memory on the next boot. I see. But information remains in RAM that enables you to carry out the rest of the attack. So what happens next? What does the attack enable? So basically it allows us to extract information from the memory that was supposed to be secret. In normal attacks, you don't think about this physical vector. So if you're thinking about having some normal encryption key or password in your memory, you usually don't think about this hardware attacks. But therefore we have uh, focused on hard drive encryption as that is specifically protecting us against these. You could say that the, uh, the most uh, impactful thing to uh, attack would be the hard drive encryption keys because once you have access to those then you also have, have access to all of the data stored on the hard drive that you could then uh, steal or potentially you can even tamper with and leave a backdoor for example in the computer but of course there are other secrets as well you might have uh, something that you were writing a document or something that would remain in memory or a password that you entered somewhere that could also remain in memory but all of that is, you know, very case by case. We don't know exactly what we expect to find there. But these uh, hard drive keys that are, they're, you know, great impact. And we also know that these uh, keys will be present since almost everybody today is using hard drive encryption. Sure. So you can read whatever is on the hard drive. Can you alter the data as well? Could you, for example, add a key logger or something like that? Yeah, once we have extracted the encryption keys for the hard disk encryption, then we can modify it as how, how much we want. Right, so when the user resumes using that machine, they're in your control. Yeah, they would perhaps notice that you know it's been shut off, but that's pretty much it. If we were able to disassemble the machine to get to this uh, chip on the motherboard, that is, it's of course easier on some models of uh, laptops than others. So very modern machines that don't have a lot of space to spare, they usually require a bit more disassembly to get to the motherboard. So, I mean, as, as long as we can do that without leaving any traces, then definitely it uh, could be a risk for the user just to continue using that machine. Right, okay. So first of all, you need physical access to the, the device and then some disassembly is required. Uh, take me through this. I'm, I'm standing next to you guys watching you do this. What, what am I seeing? Well, if it's a, a standard business laptop, normally mm -hmm. these are made to be quite serviceable. So you would uh, flip it upside down and remove a couple of screws and probably remove a panel or the whole underside of, of the laptop. And that would give you access to the motherboard. Most cases, again, for serviceability and, and, and production reasons, the flash chip would then be accessible so that you could uh, access that. And instead of having to solder wires directly onto the chip, we use a test clip. It looks like a, a clothesline uh, clip or something like that that we put on top of the chip, makes contact with all the pins, and then we use the little hardware tool to, to speak to the chip and change the contents. And then, of course, we can reassemble the machine after we're done with the, with the attack. Before we start all of this, we look that the computer is booted and we have to crash the machine too. Yeah, the, the important part that we haven't mentioned yet is of course that there has to be some secrets in memory for us to have something to steal. So uh, this is where the, the most effective mitigation against these attacks comes in, which is if you have a machine that's powered off completely and that requires some kind of uh, password to unlock the hard drive when you boot it up again, 
then of course we don't have anything to work with because then we would have to know the password for us to be able to boot the machine up and load the encryption keys into memory. But if we find a machine that's either powered on or sleeping, that already has the encryption keys in memory, or if it's a machine where we can start the machine and it will boot up Windows, for example, without requiring any user input, without requiring a password to unlock the hard drive, then of course those encryption keys will be loaded into memory. That's also the default configuration of BitLocker on Windows, uh, is to boot the machine without requiring any input from the user. Okay, so sleep mode is not enough. What about Hibernate? In Hibernate, you actually store the RAM contents to the hard drive before shutting down. So Hibernate is actually a safe mode. So how long does it take you guys to perform this attack? Well, I mean, with unscrewing the machine and finding the chip and everything, I'd say a couple of minutes. But the actual attack definitely seconds because we're relying on this memory to keep its contents and it will only hold it for so long even with uh, cooling spray so what kind of machines are vulnerable to this attack you talked about most modern computers is that the case well we can't speak for all machines because of course we haven't tested all models from all vendors but we've done extensive testing on on you know different vendors machines and it looks very much like uh, all of the PCs that we've tested uh, have this problem where the firmware settings can be manipulated by physical access. And, of course, that means that our attack will work on these machines because we haven't said this before, but those other mitigations, such as setting a password uh, on the BIOS to prevent you from booting from external media, secure boot, all these things are also settings that are stored in this flash chip and that means that they can be tampered with. So, uh, for example, we could uh, perhaps reset that password or just change the boot device, uh, the boot order, so that it will boot from USB stick happily on next boot, at the same time that we're doing this tampering with the memory overwrite request variable. Well, that's pretty uh, cool. So basically, yeah, so basically all, all models that we've looked at, and that includes the um, Apple MacBook line, MacBook Pro line, except for the very latest model, which actually does hard drive encryption in a very different way. The very latest MacBook Pro on 2018 models, I think. Uh, so all, all the PC hardware running Windows and, and Linux that we've looked at is, uh, is possible to perform this attack on. And of course, we haven't talked about desktop PCs that much because those aren't probably going to be stolen as often or lost as often in taxi, for example, as, as a tablet or, or laptop device. Absolutely. Sorry to go back uh, quite much, actually. When Ulle mentions uh, these mitigations, the reason or the mitigations need to like try to protect against us being able to boot our own code that then dumps this memory. So that's why we mention BIOS password or boot order, for example, because we are changing which uh, no, I guess, system yes. is starting. Sure, sure. Yeah, so the common mitigations that were recommended to try to minimize the risk of, of an attack like this uh, were all based around uh, you know, locking down the firmware settings so that it was harder to perform this kind of attack. But since all of these mitigations revolve around settings stored in the same flash chip, we can basically bypass all of them with the same techniques. Okay, so the original attack was introduced in 2008, and now 10 years uh, later, you've updated it to, to sort of bypass all the mitigations since to work on modern machines. How likely is it that this attack would be carried out in the real world? Like, have you guys seen any indications that it has already happened, been exploited in the wild? It's it's very hard to see indications of it in the wild because, well, uh, a correctly performed attack won't leave many traces, especially not if it's a stolen device because you might never see that device again, right? So you don't know what's happened to it. So it's very hard to, do, to uh, get any kind of indication of how prevalent this might be. What we can do is speculate that uh, people who are tasked with actually extracting information from, from uh, PCs, from hard drives, may be engaged in forensics for law enforcement or, or some other government agency that might, uh, might want to inspect people's computers. Uh, it would 
surprise us if these techniques weren't already known to to such agencies uh, and what's to say that a determined and uh, well-funded criminal adversary uh, wouldn't develop these techniques as well what would be a situation where this attack and not something else would be the best way forward for an attacker well definitely what we're looking at as the major scenario is a device loss scenario where laptop is lost in the back of a taxi or stolen in a restaurant or something like that. Um, and of course, for somebody to go to all this trouble performing this attack and you know it, developing the tools needed to perform the attack, they probably uh, are going after something that they know is going to be on that machine and not just doing it you know speculatively. If, if uh, somebody steals your laptop in a restaurant, chances are I mean, 99% chances are that uh, they're just going to resell the laptop uh, on eBay or something like that for the hardware value. Uh, and they're not actually looking to steal your secrets. But if you do have an adversary, and that, like I mentioned, it could be, for example, that your uh, adversary is a other, either foreign government or in some cases where working with um, human rights defenders, for example, it might even be your own government. So if you're working in a line of business where you actually handle secrets that are worth a lot of money, so one example could be, for example, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, R&D there is worth a lot of money. That c creates the motivation that might uh, uh, you know, motivate somebody to invest money into performing an attack like this. Whereas if you're just a, a consumer or a small business owner, then the chances are uh, this kind of, you know, slightly advanced attack will not be what's going to happen to your laptop if it gets stolen. Probably it's just going to be resold. Right. So is there anything companies can do to protect their laptops from this attack? Is there anything the users themselves can do? Well, we mentioned before that uh, the effective mitigation for this is to make sure that the machine is powered off and that it requires a password to be switched on again. What we didn't mention is that in Linux on Mac OS, this is you know, kind of easy. It's the default that you actually have to enter a password before uh, you unlock the hard drive or to actually unlock the hard drive. Uh, the difference in Windows with BitLocker is that the default configuration uh, stores these encryption keys in what's called the TPM or the Trusted Platform Module, which is a small secure chip on the motherboard that's created for exactly this purpose. And it enables the machine to actually power on without having to supply a password, which is much more convenient for users. And this has been the recommended and default way to, to use BitLocker on Windows. Problem is that that means that the machine can always be booted up to a state where it has encryption keys in memory, where they can be stolen using a cold boot attack. So uh, this mitigation actually requires that you have an IT department that's aware of this issue and a business that uh, uh, can actually take the decision to inconvenience users with having to remember yet another password to be able to, to boot up their machine, right? And for, for these reasons, i.e. that it inconveniences users and that you actually have to have, to have a, a IT department that manages the devices actively, this is probably only going to happen in a corporate environment with, you know, uh, high security requirements. Let's put it that way. None of these mitigations help if you have removable RAM. Then you can do the original cold boot attack from 2008. Yeah, for a lot of um, modern machines, small factor, slim line notebook type devices and tablet devices, uh, these RAM chips are going to be soldered to the motherboard directly. Uh, but it used to be the case, and, and for you know a number of different models, it still is the case that the memory chips are socketed, so they're quite easy to remove. And as Passy mentioned, then, of course, you can just remove the RAM chips and put them in a different machine if you want to extract the contents. And that, that was also mentioned uh, more than 10 years ago as a, an option to get at these encryption keys. But uh, it's a bit more cumbersome. You have to have more more hardware tooling as well. You have to have some kind of device to plug these chips into to read out the contents, for example. How easy is this for vendors to fix? Not that easy. Um, 
uh, as mentioned, the the operating system vendors they can only do so much. They've already uh, allowed you to pr protect yourself by having a boot up password to unlock the hard drive. So you should definitely investigate if if that's if that's the case that you're using it. Uh, it's hard for them to do much more because what we're actually doing is tampering with the firmware settings and that's in the domain of the pc hardware manufacturer and the firmware vendor that they might rely on to to help them implement the firmware and what we're hoping to see is some update to this mitigation that uh, is harder to bypass when you have physical access to the machine let's talk about that you guys notified intel microsoft and apple about your discovery uh, what actions are you looking for? What actions have they taken in response? Well, as we mentioned, the uh, the operating system vendors like Microsoft and Apple, in the in the operating system vendor capacity, they've done pretty much all they can, except for maybe investigate, you know, future additions to hardware and firmware to make this these kinds of attack harder. Then, of course, Intel and Apple are also, also platform vendors and firmware vendors themselves. So they are definitely looking into how they can make these types of attacks harder, even for older models of machines. At least that's the response we got from Apple is that uh, they're recommending that you use the firmware password to make it harder to boot from a USB drive, for example, and that they're investigating you know, possible additions to firmware on older machines that would make it harder to perform these attacks. And as we mentioned earlier, Apple have also, in, in the very latest models, uh, actually changed the way they do hard drive encryption so that that's handled by a separate secure chip that doesn't share memory with the main uh, OS CPU. How do you guys get into researching this topic? Like, what's the story there? We had a great uh, customer that actually wanted us to investigate this uh, stolen laptop scenario. And they had made great mitigations against all attacks that can happen when you have a stolen laptop, but they did not have pre-boot authentication. So even if we got a shutdown laptop, we could uh, get it into a booted mode. So this made this researching this attack quite handy and useful. Yeah, it seemed like this would be the most effective way to gain access to one of their laptops and using that access to the laptop to plant a backdoor or to steal credentials that would allow us to connect to their protected networks and use access to the machine to gain access to, to other systems and, and attack the business that way. And that's the scenario that they asked us to investigate. So was it just you guys researching this or did you get uh, help from um, other people? Well, uh, our colleague Timo Hirvonen was uh, also involved uh, in collaborating with us on this research because he'd done some previous uh, work on the software side. So we're actually reusing his uh, software to boot from USB and extract secrets from memory in, in this attack. And uh, he has also done the, the Apple research of uh, actually finding out how these uh, encryption keys are stored in, in memory on the MacBook Pro, for example. What was the research process like? What did it feel? Was it smooth, rocky, exciting? We'd planned out the the whole thing uh, really from from day one. Uh, using you know attack path mapping, we figured out what are all the possible ways that we could uh, get to our goal, and then we just went through all of those possible ways and and tried to you know weigh the pros and cons and find the one that seemed most feasible to us. And since we'd already, uh, uh, you know, seen what Timo Hirvonen and our colleague had done with uh, tr uh, trying to make cold boot attacks work on, on modern machines, we figured, you know, we got some help from him. We should be able to do this pretty easily. After, after we used his tools, we realized that, like, we managed to dump the memory of the machine, but the complete memory was cleared. So the whole memory dump of a 8 gigabyte machine was compressible to 20 megabytes. And then we realized that something is wrong here. We need to check this out. Yeah, so we, we asked Timo and he said he'd also seen this behavior. And uh, that's where our contribution started to actually research uh, why is this happening? How can we potentially 
bypass this uh, mitigation that the firmware zeroes out the memory on boot. So that was that was kind of a snag in our plan, but still it was uh, it was an interesting research problem to try to find out uh, how this was happening and then figure out a way around it. But other than that snag, if you want to call it that, you made a plan, you stuck to it, and everything worked out according to that plan. Pretty much. Is that common? Does that happen often? Often, but not every time. <laughs> so you have to be able to adapt to circumstances and. That's essentially what we did here is that we had to spend a bit more time than we'd uh, planned for in developing this uh, mitigation bypass. But, um, you know, you, you roll with the punches. You like the old uh, Mike Tyson saying that, uh, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. It's, it's part of the plan to be flexible as, as well. And we try to always uh, have some some buffer in there to make sure that we can handle unforeseen consequences. So is this a typical process for you guys when it comes to hacking stuff? If it's uh, if it's work for a client, then you need to be very structured in order to, well, first uh, to get some kind of an estimate of how much time you're going to need and how much it's going to cost the client. But then also, if you want to achieve results, you have to, like I said, you have to stay within that budget and make sure that you're working on the right thing. And if if the first line of attack doesn't work out, you need to be able to switch to a, to a different attack before the time runs out. So you need to be more structured when when you're working professionally with it. If it was a hobby project, then you know we could have, you know, all the time or all the weekends that we want, right? But uh, on on a client engagement, you need to be a bit more structured. You guys speak of uh, hobby engagements, and when you were younger, what was that like? When did you know that you were going to be a hacker? That's a very hard question, I guess. If you always play around with uh, machines and try to make them do stuff that they were not supposed to do, then I guess it's a very good indication that you are what you're going to do in the end. I mean, looking back at it, you could see indications from an early age. For example, I know that when I was only four or five or something, I was taking apart all old rotary phones to figure out what was inside and what made them, what made the noises, things like that. Uh, so I was always very interested in taking things apart to see how they worked on the inside. And that's definitely the kind of uh, motivation and mindset that, that helps you do this kind of work. Yeah, sure. So how would you summarize this? What is the one takeaway you want to leave our listeners with about this attack? Don't use sleep mode. Yeah, we have we have used this phrasing. I think Ole invented it. Sleep mode is vulnerable mode. I think that's a really nice saying. That's going on a T-shirt. Mm. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and and don't forget that sleep mode uh, uh, might be bad, but you know uh, you might be vulnerable if you've completely powered off the machine too. If you're not using the preboot authentication system. So if you're running Mac OS, if you're running Linux, then you probably are. But if you're uh, a Windows user, uh, you need to look for that blue screen that says BitLocker pin and asks you to enter something when you start the computer. So that in combination with turning the computer off or, or in hibernate mode, which also turns it off, is what you want to be looking for to, to minimize the risk of this attack. And I think one more thing is that you should you should not expect things to work the way that you assume them to. That's a good general rule that uh, unless you've actually verified that something works in the way you think it does, don't put too much trust into it. So I think people have become a bit too complacent about lost laptops, for example, because they think, oh, well, it's encrypted. It doesn't matter if we lose one. But do you actually know what the exposure might be? That's important to find out. If I lose my laptop permanently, there's not much I can do about that. But if I lose my laptop for a minute and then find it again later, should I be super worried about starting to use it again? Maybe not if you lose it for a minute, but uh, if you're leaving your laptop unattended somewhere, then you should be uh, aware that there are physical access attacks that can be uh, uh, can be a risk. So, for example, we uh, have published other guidance uh, last year about the evil made class of attacks, which is basically a tempering attack with uh, physical access to hardware as well. And those are also uh, relevant to that use case. Um, if I think the, the most important thing is that, you know, if you lose your machine, 
you should have a backup plan for what do you do when your machine has been lost. So that could be for an organization to keep track of what is stored on there, what kind of passwords might be used with that machine, what kind of VPN credentials, and make sure that those are invalidated once the machine is lost. So make sure that the users actually report that they've lost the machine so that you can put in some kind of uh, protection in place that to make those credentials uh, uh, useless to an attacker, for example. All right, but you don't have to go as far as to always store your laptop in a tamper evident bag or anything like that. <laughs> that depends on your on on your paranoia level, and it also depends on what you have uh, on that machine that somebody might want to steal. Right back to uh, the whole, you know, if you don't have anything to steal, then nobody's going to spend the effort and time to actually steal it directly from you. If you have winning lottery numbers, you should protect it quite well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the the average consumer probably doesn't have an attacker that's you know out to steal their specific data. So this is probably not in their threat model, but uh, for business users, it might make sense to, to actually find out what the exposure is and take according steps. Yeah, I know my paranoia level is super high and it seems to be getting higher <laughs> the longer I'm yeah, in this you, you can't take it too far, man. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys, for, uh, for coming and taking us through this uh, attack. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jana. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSauna. Thanks for listening.